My name is Ben. I'm your host for today's session. Welcome to our 1130 session. We've got an exciting agenda for you. In the next half an hour, you'll be expected to uh, hear great things from our multiple presenters. And before we get started, I would just like to let you know that today's session is available with captioning and it's also being recorded to be available for viewing post conference. If you have any questions, please enter them into the chat and we'll be monitoring the chat very closely. We appreciate that you stay till the end of the session where we will be launching a very short Zoom poll. That way you can help us improve and provide any feedback to our pre presenters and speakers. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our next set of speakers. There are three of them, so I'll make sure I'll be quick on reading their amazing bio. So in this session, we'll be hearing about virtual care work through primary care network in Burnaby, specifically on the solution of clinic call. We have our first speaker, Dr. Brinder Narang. Dr. Narang is a clinical assistant professor with the Department of Family Practice at UBC. A medical contributor for Global BC and CKNW980, and a family physician for the REACH Community Healthcare Center. Dr. Narang plays a pivotal role in the dissemination of resources and support to the community and remains a trusted, reliable health source for his community members. We also have Georgia Beku, who is the Executive Director of the Burnaby Division of Family Practice. Georgia is an accomplished healthcare leader with over 20 years senior leadership experience in government and public sector organizations, specializing in healthcare and population health at the community level, and has held leadership roles in BC in the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Advanced Education, and Ministry of Education. Last but not least, we have our third presenter, Erica Kober, who is a leader in primary healthcare transformation with 10 plus years of local and international experience. Over the years, she has been involved in the strategy and design for primary care innovations, including the development of Burnaby's primary care networks. In her current role as a senior director for the Burnaby Division of Family Practice, Erica oversees the design and implementation for Burnaby's primary care networks and patient medical homes. Over to you three, welcome very much. Um, thanks so much for that kind introduction. So I'm Dr. Brenda Narang. Um, thanks for having us from the Burnaby Divisions Family Practice. I'm chair of the board for Burnaby Divisions. Um, as we get started, I want to recognize that um, uh, we're here in Burnaby and we recognize that we are on the ancestral and ceded uh, homelands of the Hakumenum and Skohimish speaking people and grateful to be here on this territory. Um, Erica and I are going to do most of the slide. Uh, Erica, as we said, is our primary care network director, and Georgia um, is our executive director, Becky, and she will um, help uh, help uh, guide us if we uh, strive off or into the wayward. Um, but yeah, so um, Erica is going to be um, slide driver. And so what we're going to talk about today is clinical. What is clinical? Um, you're going to hear us talk about that interchangeably with um, the Burnaby Virtual Care Network, which is the concept. Clinical is the brand, the name, the concept of the Burnaby Virtual Care Network. So we'll use them interchangeably. Um, and then, of course, any questions that might come up, um, just bug us anytime. If someone feels I need to be muted, just mute me anytime, too. That's what people usually do. Um, so the purpose of this, uh, um, what we're talking about is, um, we're talking about what is this? Like virtual care network, cool, there's many of them. It can mean a thousand different things to a thousand different people. Um, but like the way we envision it is it's a singular online portal for patients in Burnaby um, or for the Burnaby uh, patients of Burnaby family physicians who are looking to book uh, their visit. So it's a really simple concept, but there's a lot to unpack there because it's more, uh, it's so much more, um, than just a booking tool. And for us to really understand what our vision of clinical was, um, I'm going to take you back a couple of years because this works um, really did start um, around the time COVID hit, but we were already thinking about it at the time of COVID, which is, um, you know, what, what, how do we future proof family practice? Knowing that family medicine has been slowing, uh, uh, dying a slow death over decades, um, knowing that the infrastructure and um, that we use is quite antiquated, that we operate in silos, um, and that um, the work is becoming more complex. And um, until two weeks ago, um, the viability was very much in question. So we'll we'll add that part in um, after. But so when we were thinking about this. Um, 
was saying, what, what do we need to help support our practices in Burnaby, knowing that in Burnaby, our population, um, 200, 250,000 people um, were, you know, a, a, a urban city, a multicultural uh, population. And, uh, you know, the theme of uh, this Digital Health Week is a um, um, about empowerment, equity, and inclusion. So these were, um, I was actually happy when we were asked to speak here because these are the type of thinking that we, we think about all the projects we do through our division work as well. So at the time we're thinking, okay, what are some hacks? There's like episodic issues um, that aren't being solved by um, um, UPCCs or whatever, um, walk-in clinics that often operate in silos too, longitudinal practices. And from a patient perspective, um, they're, they're not really guided well in how to um, navigate this network. And so then there's like daytime hours after after hours, then you're looking at attached populations and unattached populations. And we're like, there's lots of um, intricacies and nuances there of gaps in access. And so we started thinking, how can we actually use this primary care network model, which is the goal is to uni unite our practices that have traditionally worked in their own spaces for um, community empowerment. And so when we're, we're looking at this, um, we're looking at what are the things that we saw in the landscape that we needed to look at. There's, um, we knew from a physician's perspective, we, we've built up a lot of um, engagement with our physician base so that we are, um, we have good trust from them um, to work on their behalf. Um, we know the power of networking, staying relevant in the logistics, uh, changing landscape. And then as we think about it, how do we future-proof primary, primary care and also embrace um, some virtual changes um, and preserving with the goal of preserving full scope family practice um, as a collective. And so we did a lot of engagement with our docs and then we're thinking, okay, does this mean we kind of go to a singular EMR um, knowing that um, the mentality has always been, we hate our EMR, but you'll kill me before you make me change it because data portability pricing and um, everything involved with um, changing of EMR um, can be um, soul crushing and soul destroying as well. And so immediately you think that's not going to be a scalable solution of trying to get a harmonized EMR solution, um, knowing that the vendors hold so much power in the space as well. Um, so for the average physician's clinic, um, it was a losing proposition. Then we started looking, cool, is there any um, way we could start looking at a, a vendor um, um, for an EMR uh, for an after hour solution so we can have a common EMR for after hours that we can hopefully tie into our urgent care or into some of our allied health um, PCM work where we have, um, well, I guess I should give a bit of background. So like in, in Burnaby, every single person in Burnaby has access to a counselor and social worker and can be referred for a Burnaby, a, sorry, a Be Well um, um, program, which is our um, only we're the only city in the province that have this, which is a funded behavioral change program under the direction of clinical psychologists. And so in our mind, my mind was like, how can we integrate these services um, in a smarter way with our primary care services without, um, you know, be, um, being re uh, relying on uh, referrals. So then we went, we did, we met with a lot of vendors, including, um, you know, Mois, which we heard about earlier, and I see Bill here, good to see you, Bill, um, and um, a few of the other vendors that um, have presences in BC, and some that didn't necessarily have a presence in BC, to really understand what are they looking at, what is the pricing, what is the features, um, and what are, like, the uh, opportunities for interoperability. And it was kind of almost like a David versus Goliath situation here. It's like, we, we know that we're a small community, um, but there are really big um, challenges that we have to overcome of looking at this on scale about how we can integrate these um, 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 these these uh, siloed clinics. And so we started working in a the direction then of a, an EMR agnostic solution from a higher level saying, okay, let's look, forget looking at it from the physician's perspective, let's look at it from a patient perspective. They're a Burnaby patient, they can click on a website and see what's available in the city. And um, we got inspired a bit by that because I trained in Australia and they have sit, um, um, uh, mechanisms and systems set up like that. They have something called Health Engine there, which allows you to directly book into your um, um, your, your family doctor's clinic, your, even your allied health, your physio, your chiro, your 
a massage therapist. So they have like infrastructure set up over there. So we started looking at some of the decision rules, looking at what, again, what are the companies doing here? We basically looked at every solution that was available on the market. Um, and then COVID happened and really accelerated a lot of this too. So we've gone through a lot of iterations um, in that time. And this is, so what we're now presenting um, is clinical. And I would say about six months ago or six to nine months ago is where we actually finally landed on um, a, a viable way um, that we could actually implement this um, with our own um, physicians, um, knowing that this was also the product that refused to die. And um, Erica and George, I'll tell you, it's because I refused to let it die. Um, but there were many times where we were like, we, this is just, we can't do this. Um, but we have. And, and that's what we we're talking about. So I, I refresh them. So I've rambled a bit, but just bringing it back to focus, singular online portal for patients that are looking to book a family physician visit, whether it's their family doctor available, and if not, another physician within the community in a way that preserves longitudinal care. Also where unattached patients can access a family doctor quickly, um, easily and add themselves to our attachment wait list. And also um, looking at virtual after hours service from the community. And together so we're looking at how can we do community-based after hours coverage um, so that individual physicians do not have to face the burden of um, being there for their patients 24-7, which was, is a college expectation, but is not re realistically possible in today's world. And so here, like our goals of this are you know, benefits, uh, this is how we would talk to our physicians about the benefits of joining the network is you have patients on the web can get, get uh, who can get redirected to your own community. So, you know, you're not losing them to a, um, a profit-based um, uh, uh, corporate alternative that have been proliferating um, in the space over the last few years. Um, and of course, there's a convenience of booking, um, freeing up work on MOAs. Um, and as actually um, one of the huge parts of it was that our walk-in clinics actually suffered a lot during COVID because um, they couldn't get vol um, volumes to come in in person and they were having trouble adapting too. So part of this was uh, we have membership that represent our walk-in clinics too and say, well, there's no reason that like if you're full and your colleague down the uh, street has had a cancellation or has an opening or just hasn't filled up that like you guys should not know what's happening. So it's like we have kind of looked at this from a platform to help that in real time know what is available in the community mm -hmm. than the after hours. And what else we've now built in is um, um, secure provider to provider messaging. We're working provider um, to uh, patient um, secure messaging as well, knowing again, part of this is all, how do we actually look at secure communication? Um, because if we are providing integrated virtual work, um, um, yeah, like you can't just fax and email things from home or wherever you're working from or expect that the patient is able to receive it. And I have people working on my roof right now, so really sorry about that. Um, the direct benefits from the page, the clinic, what we're looking at is just like economy is a, a scale here. It's like um, working with a vendor that we actually, the company we're working with, we were able to then look at bulk rates, um, look at a way to subsidize um, um, pricing for our clinic so that they do um, want to uh, um, uh, um, have wanted to join this uh, community-based service that they don't have to take a financial hit to try to modernize their infrastructure, which has always been a problem intake forms automated reminders all that stuff is all part of it too um one of the other big value adds is and this is kind of the crux of like virtual like the whole virtual care discussion is virtual care without being tied to a physical space for potential need for follow-up is not adequate medicine like you need to have a mechanism and so this is where we thought um through the system, let's say someone does have a virtual appointment at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. or even 3 p.m. And they say, okay, the doctor says, you know what, I need this person to be seen in person. I don't think they need to go to emergency, but I can then look at my network in the community and see who has some physical spots that are open. And we can then redirect them in. So you're closing that loop of care. So while the physical follow-up might not be with you specifically, it'll be, you at least know that that patient has a place that they can be seen. And this to me is, I think the biggest value add, because then you're, you have a mechanism to not just say, well, I think someone needs to touch your belly because you have abdominal pain. And then say, oh, I don't know where to send you. I guess you just go to emerge. 
but that doesn't add value. It doesn't save the system any money. It's not effective for the patient and it's not patient centered. And so this, these are like kind of the value judgments, sort of the values that we have built into this um, work um, from the onset. And so now I've given a bit of the concept and the history and, um, but to actually see it, um, I, um, Erica, if you can maybe take people through it. Sure, yeah, thank you, Dr. Nering. So I'm just gonna sort of go over where we are today and, and how this works. So there are two pieces of, of tech functionality to this system. One is a booking platform for patients and the interface that we're using is connecting directly to participating physician EMRs and we'll display all of those availabilities in one place. And I'll show you that in a moment. We also have worked on a provider to provider messaging system that also connects to uh, the EMR and I will show you what that looks like. Um, we are connected to Oscar EMRs, Juno, um, Oscar, Acura, uh, um, and uh, soon Mile. Um, unfortunately, TELUS EMRs are not currently connected to this system. This is uh, just a, a still shot of what the messenger looks like. So it's an end-to-end -end encrypted system that's integrated into the EMR um, where we're actually uh, looking at this platform. We think that there's going to be a ton of opportunity to further build on PCN teams and having our allied staff work with our family doctors, especially um, with the new um, uh, compensation model that Dr. Narang will, will speak to you um, after I, I finish showing you some stills of the site. Um, but uh, so lots of opportunity there, also for our physicians to work with each other and also for our walk-ins to communicate with family physicians um, so that they can um, uh, uh, support longitudinal care. So um, I, I'm not gonna get too far deep into this today, but this is a view from an Oscar EMR. And when you're looking at an Oscar EMR, you can actually just click um, a button and let's say you wanted to send a quick document over, the document can be sent um, directly. There's a, a lot of, I can talk a lot about this. There's a verification system for people um, before you can even get access to this. And it's this is not for patients, this is just for providers. So um, lots of opportunities as we look at this down the road. But I think for us, the main barrier that we kept coming up against with any of these technologies is, um, you know, if it's not connected to my EMR, it's another system that I have to open and that has has continued to be a barrier. Um, um, so can this I is- make a yes, comment yes, Erica, Georgia. around that? So why this is so important is the idea here is Although patients are booking into virtual appointments, and you'll see how it works here um, in a second, um, and uh, and they may end up seeing someone other than their family physician, the entire system is driven towards preserving longitudinal care. So the ease of communication between the physician and the clinic that sees the patient and the pa if they're attached, their home physician is really key, and the ability to move information between providers in a safe, seamless, and easy way that, that goes right back into the EMR is, is an is essential to being able to actually successfully preserve longitudinal care. Thank you, Georgia. Um, so what you're seeing here is just a still of the website. Um, there are many different parts of the website where um, you can select to see a fam your family doctor. So in phase one, this is what's being built out right now, you can look for a virtual or walk-in appointment or book with your family doctor. We always want people to prioritize the relationship with their family doctor, and we will have language on the website to continue to encourage people to seek out care from their longitudinal provider. Um, but when a patient clicks on an appointment, so for example, if you clicked on um, view appointments from the walk-in side, um, what you're going to do is get a real-time picture of all of the physician participating physician schedules in one place coming from different EMRs together. So what you're going to see, these are just examples um, of the type of appointments. So some might be specialty appointments. So for example, one of our physicians might be offering a pap smear clinic to patients that are not their own. So um, what you're seeing here is, is it virtual? Is it in person? There will be a variety um, of options. Um, Similarly, 
if you have a family doctor, your family doctor might be participating if they have a compatible EMR and um, a, a patient will be able to actually book directly with their family physician um, if they end up here. And, and um, a, a really important thing for us was um, catching uh, patients who, you know, we live in a culture of convenience care. I, very guilty of that as well. Although working with family doctors for a year has really changed my relationship with my family doctor. Um, but uh, it's really reminding patients that um, there's so much value in longitudinal care in that relationship. And really, you know, you go online, you do a Google search. If you're uh, located in Burnaby, um, just on um, Google search engine optimization, we're hoping that this will come up and redirect you back to your family physician rather than seeking episodic care elsewhere. Um, the other really important um, utilization of this is for our partners in the emergency department and elsewhere in the system. If they're seeing a patient of a family doctor and they want their patient to see their doctor, they can actually in one place log on and see what's available in the communities and likewise for walk-in clinics as well. Uh, every Thursday before a long weekend, we get an email from our health authority partners and say, what walk-in service is available, who's open and what are their hours. Um, so this will really help in terms of accessibility and, and system navigation in our community. Um, and once you click book, uh, this is what the booking form will look like. And again, um, no information is stored within our system. It's directly um, written into the EMR. So from a security perspective, this is one of the considerations when we were choosing um, the platform that we're working with. Um, uh, uh, each clinic has their own workflows and, and um, uh, this is designed for them so they can have patient intake questionnaires. Um, this will have specific services, but most importantly for our family physicians who are not providing walk-in care, only their patients will be able to book with them. So the system knows that your patient um, of their practice because uh, it can read your personal health number. Um, and likewise for walk-in clinics, the system set up a certain way where you don't have to have an existing relationship with a provider or a clinic to book if they're making their schedule available. Um, you're probably wondering where we are now and some of you might be checking to see if this website is live. It's not, it's under development right now. We're going through a round of testing to make sure there are no bugs, things look accessible in the way um, that people want uh, to, to access care. Uh, the provider to provider messaging platform is being developed and we have it being tested by uh, pilot users in our community. So we have our family physicians using it, giving feedback, um, making sure that it's going to do what it's doing. You, the the um, photos you saw were real photos of the system. Um, in Burnaby, we have 30 physicians signed up to participate. That's, that's growing um, as we get further engage with practices. Some of our practices are shifting to systems. So really making the opportunity known to our physicians. Um, we are looking to launch go live date for late December and uh, or early January. Um, so again, uh, just depends on how our, our testing and, and debugging goes. Um, right now, uh, MedFAR, which is a mile, make your life easy EMR, is connecting to the VCM platform. Um, and I forgot to put Juno underneath. So Oscar, Akiro, Juno, and then Maya will be connected. So that captures about 50% of the physicians in our community. We are also working with three to four other communities who would like to participate and have a similar system in their geographic area and also looking at potentials for, you know, how can our communities work together in the future and put potential opportunities for cross coverage. Um, Georgia, I think you're, or Dr. Nering. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just add a couple of things onto there. Thanks, Erica. That's great. Um, so, I mean, can I add one more thing before you? I just, just, uh, I, I'm, I if you to must, say one more thing. That's fine. Um, phase two of clinical for us, our community really closely monitors allied health utilization for the resources that were hired into our PCN. And what we're really looking at is we know that there's a lot of unattached patients in our community who need care um, in the same way that attached patients do. So what we'll be looking at is making other services available to community residents who might not be attached to a family physician, but would still benefit from access to a social worker, a mental health clinician, our health coaching program at Dr. Narang spoke about, um, group classes. So we want to leverage all of the capacity um, in our system to make sure that the people needing it the most have access to it. So that will be phase two, which you'll probably see in the second quarter of next year. Uh, sorry, Dr. Narang. 
you never have to apologize. Um, and, and I know we, we are a bit over and there are some questions, so um, we'll get to them. But I think part of why we're looking at sustainability more moving forward and, you know, if the new payment model hadn't come out a couple of weeks ago, I probably wouldn't have seen the benefit in presenting this right now. Um, because some of you have actually seen this presentation from, uh, you know, iteration three to four months ago. But the the payment model we'll talk about separately. Despite that, we had thir um, 30 docs in a community uh, um, in an urban center that were willing to come together um, um, to serve patients. And it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a bloody lot. And that those are early adopters, knowing that um, they were willing to, they believed in the mission of what we were doing and are willing to work with it because they know it can um, work. Now, um, or sort of the value, the, the idea behind it is sound because it's patient centered. Now, when we're talking about other communities, we're talking about other major urban centers in the lower mainland who actually believe in the visual of, uh, uh, vision of building a brand like this as a public alternative for um, patient-centered virtual um, care that supports um, longitudinal attachment. So we have gotten um, a lot of interest and in other communities are actually um, ready to sign on. Um, now, we haven't mentioned the, the partner we're working. The partner we're working with is Cortico, which some clinics use in their own individual context, but for us, they've actually worked with us to help build out the messaging um, and the decision rules. Um, so they have been a strong partner in this project and important parts were that they had the ability to show in real time and that they weren't storing any patient data on their own servers, um, which is a value add. So through this process, we had, pay, we had docs that had never considered switching their EMRs, who now are half switched EMRs, um, so that one, because they needed to modernize, but two, so they could also take part in this system as well. And that's all before the sustainability piece happened. This almost died many times because of funding. We didn't know how we were going to have uh, make it viable for physicians to leave their own practices, whether during the day or open up spots in their practices during the day or after hours um, without being added quickly able to compensate them for their time. A lot of the pay, and a lot of you might not be familiar with the nuances of the new payment model, but there is um, there is funding available for this type of work as part of that. So physicians who have their own fine practice can still work like they want to do two, three hours after hours virtual care. It would be fiscally viable for them to do this. And there are incentives there for them to do that too, which is good. That's patient-centered. When we look at um, the um, capacity of, our, of people to modernize their own systems, a huge barrier was the, the cost about it. Um, now, we know that the PHSA is leading the Connected Health um, Strategy Work, and I've been fortunate to um, you know, be supporting that. And uh, Doctors of BC is also leading the Digital Health Strategy Work as well. Between all these work, this work that is happening, going towards a more connected system, I don't know if this is the right solution that could be scaled provincially, but I do know it, 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 this is the principles behind this work um, should absolutely inform how we look at upstream um, foundation building for like longitudinal virtual care to preserve primary care. Um, because if you don't think about it from the patient centered view or like, and you're looking how they're going to navigate it and how the relationship that's important with their family doc, um, then they're going to get lost. And so I think that all I really wanted to say about it now, um, I know that there's some questions going in the chat, Erica, you address some of them uh let's see here. yeah i was just looking at the first question okay. so uh yeah. is the message about the patient uh attached to a patient file in the emr automatically yes so there's a button you're having a conversation with someone you can actually just hit a button um that will put that into your progress note of your emr so we're trying to make it very functional. So right now that integration is working really well with Oscars. Uh, Oscar EMRs will be tackling the other ones next. Um, I think I answered the next one. Is this live? Um, no, not yet. Uh, but our providers are using the, the tech pieces right now um, just to get them used to um, flows for their clinics. I'm not sure yeah, Georgia, for, uh... Dr. Nering, who wants to answer uh, the next uh, question. Yeah, Georgia, you want to? Yeah. So um, it's the way that we have the development work um, that we've done for this um, has really been uh, creatively leveraging 
several different funding pots that have been available to the division and to the PCN in order to get this off the ground. Um, we, um, and um, it has been really important for us to be able to, uh, to provide an incentive to support. Incentive meaning su helping the family practices to actually join on to this. Um, and so uh, having access to some PCN funding and some of our GPSC funding has enabled us to um, both develop it and 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 make it possible for the practices to join on at a reasonable um, at a reasonable long term cost and a short term kind of um, a, a, a leveraged short term um, opportunity to get on board. So that it's it's um, several funding pots that have allowed us to get to this spot. Yeah, Next and I'll just question. look at a few um, uh, the division of family practice generally. Uh, so we talked about that. what is the vision for expanding. So the vision for expanding the service really um, comes down to we we have to we only know what we know in our community, which is we know what our practices are doing. We have met with many other divisions to look at their um, situations. Um, we do think that the divisions understand the family practice landscape the most, so that is the mechanism um, that makes sense for us to pursue. Um, um, so when we try, it's not necessarily just expanding across Fraser Health. We've had um, practices on the island uh, um, and on uh, in coastal, and actually I think across most health authorities um, talk to us about um, this. Um, and see how it works for them. I think the biggest obstacle in maintaining and expanding this tool is just, you know, even with this um, um, approach, we are still only able to um, hit 50% of our potential practices because one of the biggest players in the province does not want to work on interoperability. Um, and when we did approach them to do that, we were um, told to fork up um, seven figures to get them to talk to us. And so it's not really um, something that can be done on scale. I don't think we ever, when we started this project, it was not with the view of looking at a provincially scalable solution, but people, once they heard about the work that they were doing, they came to us because there are similar um, projects happening around the province, but um, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, it's just the, working in your silos type thing. And so there is now, um, because a lot of the EMRs that we're working on are available um, across the province as well, um, people will be looking at that. A lot of EMRs will have some of their own solutions, but this is not like an EMR um, solution only to us. The bigger principle of what's driving this, again, is higher up. This is a community level approach um, to approach primary care. And so I think from that perspective, um, the scalability options are easy. Can I make one comment? Yeah. I think we're probably near the end. One mm. of the ways to think about this is, so we have been working on clinical Burnaby. It is conceivable to have a clinical Vancouver, a clinical Chilliwack, a clinic, et cetera. And, um, and, and, and also it's so, cause one of the drivers for us is capitalizing on the capacity in the local community. So it's possible to stay local and also go beyond Burnaby. And that's the conversations we're having with other communities. Um, but also there's great opportunities to deal with after hours care by doing some cross community um, integration, you know, uh, um, capitalizing on capacity across communities. But those are things that we have to work out with the other communities. So they're not decisions that mm. Burnaby would make. We'd make them together. But there's tremendous opportunity to, to leverage collective capacity. If we pull and there's up, and this is not like and this. and I know Ben's getting ready to kick us off. But I got one thing I got to say, but um, and thanks Georgia for that. But I think that the, the important thing is this is not us selling a tool or anything to anyone else. Like clinical has been made in a way that we just the only reason we needed to put a brand on it is when we started thinking this could be scalable. If it's scalable, then through brand recognition in publicly delivered virtual care services led by your divisions of family practice or whoever then you have a viable alternative to the you know the ads that are in your face all day every day because that's where the awareness comes from and so that's the only reason kind of we've done the whole branding marketing private too it it's it's really though the concept that is driving the work we're doing
Thank you very much, Brenda, Georgia, and Erica. Sorry to have interrupted you. I'm sure the audience could probably keep you here for an easily an extra hour if we had the time. But unfortunately, we have to uh, move on to our next presentation. So thank you once again for your joint presentation uh, on um, this exciting new solution. And for everybody who still wants to keep asking our presenters uh, questions like we have entered into the Zoom chat, please continue to enter your questions there and we'll make sure we'll forward them to our presenters and they get a chance to respond to you.